Hey, welcome to Church at the Well. My name is VJ, one of the pastors on staff here. And um, yeah, I had a question for you to discuss with whoever's sitting near you, whether you know them or not. This is a good way to get to know some people. The question is, what is your happy place? And, and I mean, like, you know, what's that ideal place where you feel so happy? What are you doing? Who are you with? Where are you? What are you eating? I'm just showing my cards. That's going to be for sure a part of my happy place, what I'm eating. So take a couple minutes together with each other. What is your happy place? Describe it to one another. Go ahead. Well, it would certainly seem that, I don't know, happiness, pursuing happiness, right, is a part of what it means to be human, isn't it? That's just sort of an instinctive thing. It's not like when you were born, as you grew up, somebody had to tell you, hey, you need to do the things that will make you happy. You need to pursue your own happiness. I mean, certainly as a, as a nation and really as a continent, Western civilization in many ways was founded on this idea that this is our right and our, um, our identity as people to pursue our own happiness, whether it's the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada or in the United States, as they say, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Certainly this is what the Western world is about. And yet, even though it seems natural, instinctive, part of what it means to be human, it's a very complicated pursuit. Here's what I mean. Arthur Brooks, who's a uh, Harvard professor and a social scientist, uh, wrote a book called From Strength to Strength. And one of the things he described in that book is he said, here's what the happiness equation looks like. He says, happiness for us as people equals our haves, what we have, divided by our wants. Our haves divided by our wants. If our haves are more than what we want, we are happy. And that sounds good. So he said, we spend all of our lives pursuing the numerator, the little math word for you, the top part, the haves. We pursue getting more, what more we can have. He said, the problem is what we found is through research is the more we pursue our haves, unaware, un unbeknownst to us, our wants grow at a faster pace, which means that the more we have, the more we want, which means we actually get less happy the more we have. Malcolm Gladwell, in his research for um, uh, something that he called desirable difficulties in one of his books, he actually uses an example of this and describes the upside down U curve as it relates to happiness and wealth. And again, some of you math nerds are just loving today because there's equations, there's charts. Some of you are flinching. You're going to, uh, uh, you know, the fetal position saying no more. No, this little chart, very simple. He said, as wealth increases up to a certain point, our happiness increases. But then he said it starts to flatten out where you can have more money, but you're not, and which means you may have a nicer car in your driveway than the neighbor who has less money than you, but you're not any more happy than she is. And then he said over time, actually when you get into uh, past a certain point of wealth, your happiness starts to go down. Life becomes difficult in more difficult ways. And he said that number actually was $75,000 household income. Now you can don't at me with all the inflation stats. Okay, fine. Maybe it's a little bit higher. His point is there's a point at which enough is enough. It's not making us any happier. And actually over time it would go down if we lost it. 
Derek Thompson in an article he wrote a couple of years ago in The Atlantic. Uh, he's a, a, the head of uh, economics for this publication. And he said um, that we now in the West, because of our prosperity and because of social media, are living in a state of what he called perma FOMO. We are permanently feeling like we are missing out, fear of missing out. That's what FOMO is. Because we know more than ever all of the things that we don't have that we could have, that we should have, that we've missed out on, that we're missing out on today, that we need to get more of. I mean, you, may, you take all those, uh, those studies together and you think, man, this pursuit of happiness is complicated. I mean, certainly in a culture like ours where we have equated sexual satisfaction with happiness, it would seem actually the more sex we have, we are not more satisfied, we are more addicted and somehow less satisfied. I mentioned last week too, if the pursuit of happiness is our main goal when it comes to relationships, dating and marriage, that oftentimes we will get into a relationship we shouldn't because we think it's going to make us happy. We will leave a relationship we shouldn't because we think we're not happy anymore. And so I need to move on because the goal of these relationships is my personal happiness. This is a problem. Now you might say, well, why are we talking about this today? <laughs> why are you bumming me out? Why are you making me squirm? Welcome to church. Uh, no, because we're actually in a series called The Upside Down Party. Um, the directions back to community, to great community, the upside down party, the rhythm of, or the orientation of our lives and what it means to actually live a full life in community with God and with each other. Um, we started last week, we're talking about up, the, the, the vector that points up, that is our worship life with God. If you missed that, I'd love to encourage you to go back and get that. But today we're talking about side, the dimension of our horizontal uh, relationships in the faith community, in the church. That's the side dimension. And what's interesting is, whether you're new to church or first time in a long time or part of the woodwork or whatever, you probably know that the pursuit of happiness in church is a difficult thing. Because if you've been in church for any period of time, or maybe you left because of this, we get hurt in the church. And so it's not a happy place for us. And so we, we leave or we stand at a distance, not sure we want to get very close anymore because it wasn't a happy thing for us. Or perhaps he's saying, yeah, I like church, but I got a lot of other things that I like more that actually give me more happiness than church. And so I try to be, I try to be there on Sundays and whatever, maybe come to home group from time to time, but or a prayer meeting. But for the most part, other things make me happier than those things, than a Sunday gathering, than a home group, than a prayer meeting or whatever, or serving in church. So I just do the things that make me happier. And so I just don't do this as much. Or you might say, you know what? I'm happy right where I am. I like the music or I like the teaching or my kids love youth group. And that's enough for me. And so we stand at a distance. And so this happiness thing is a bit complicated when it comes to the church and in life. So you might say, VJ, what's the solution? Just don't try to be happy. Just dial it all down. No. But what's interesting is that while we are pursuing our happiness, God is pursuing something else in our lives. Uh, it's also <laughs> begins with an H, but it's not happiness. And I want you to listen to this passage as it's read for us and see if you can spot the word. It's fun to get a little guessing game on what the thing is that God is interested in, H word, more than our happiness, but that is actually a, real, uh, a, really bit of good, a bit of really good news for us, for people who realize that the pursuit of happiness is kind of complicated. So have a listen to the scripture and we'll talk about it together. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Well, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. And forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. 
Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Did you catch it? Okay, I know there's a few H words in there, so it's not really fair, but (laughs) let me just summarize it very briefly. While we might be interested in being happy people, God is making us holy people. We are pursuing our happiness, but God is pursuing our holiness, not just as individuals, but as a community. This passage we read talks about uh, the, the church being a holy people. Now, at first glance, God trying to make us holy while we're trying to make us happy, that sounds like the worst thing God could do to us, right? Oh no, like like God trying to make us holy because in part that word holy has a lot of baggage for us. Um, At best, the word holy just sounds boring. Just like, I'm not interested in that stuff. Oh, that's what church is or that's what religion is. That's why I checked out. That's why I don't come very often. Like that's it, that holy sounds boring. At worst, it sounds like, religious pride, self-righteousness. We had a term back in the day called holier than thou. You know, if someone's holier than thou, they're like, oh my gosh, they're always just boasting or even indirectly implying how, how much better they are of a person or they're so righteous or they're so good or they do all these pious or religious or good things. Like that's what we think the word holy is. In fact, like if you got invited today to church and a friend of yours, you know, brought you and they, they asked you after and say, hey, what'd you think? And, and you said, wow, you seem like you're a really holy church. You'd be like, oh no, what happened? What? You know, and don't say that. It doesn't sound like a compliment, does it? But why is God pursuing our holiness one of the most beautiful and loving things that God could do for you? Why is it actually the key for those of us that otherwise would be tempted to pursue our happiness? First of all, we begin with this idea of like, we gotta understand the word. Because if we really understood it, if we read this thing that says, oh, you are a holy people, we would cheer, we would go, yeah! But we don't understand the word, and so we don't. It begins with, the scriptures all the way through describe first God as holy. And to say we worship a holy God is to say God is a God and a being like no other. That word holiness means, or to be holy is is uniquely different, unlike any other, set apart. And in fact, at times it says in some of the songs that will be sung to God or sung to God is holy, holy, holy which is uh, in, in the Hebrew language and in the first century and kind of the literary technique of repetition was to say when we can't say it enough, repetition, holy, holy, holy. We're saying, God, there's nobody like you. And that word holiness is actually, you know, an, an adjective almost, it, 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 it augments or describes every one of God's other characteristics. So his love is holy love. It means he's, it's a love like no other. It is 100% authentic, 100% pure. God is not a user of people. He doesn't lust after people. Lust just is someone who takes and uses. God doesn't do that. He doesn't need us to, to make himself feel better. His love for us is pure. It's a holy love. His beauty is holy, as in like, it's not just, you know, we design like cars that look beautiful on the outside, but if you peel back the beautiful piece of leather or the beautiful piece of metal, inside it's all gnarly and doesn't look beauty because beauty's on the outside. Well, that's what we find about creation. You go to the deepest parts of the sea and it's beautiful and beautiful, even the stuff nobody sees. God's beauty is holy. There's nothing like, it is completely other. There is no artist like God. God's relationships, God's way with people is pure. He doesn't have mixed motives. He's, he's not um, sort of codependent on us, needing our worship, trying to get us to do stuff. He doesn't manipulate us. He is actually the eternally happy one. Therefore, he's, he's pure, he's holy. This is the, it describes the uniqueness of who God is. And then, get this, this passage and many others say that now, not only is God holy, but he calls us as individuals to be holy and he makes the church a group of holy people. He is making us holy, which is to say that to be holy people is not to be God, but to be God-like. Not in terms of like, yeah, power, grab lightning bolts, throw them at people. No, no, like the, the character of God that we also would have a love that is pure, 
that doesn't have mixed motives in it, that is truly selfless, that our generosity would not be so somebody would think highly of us or give something back to us, but that our generosity, our kindness would be true and good, that our character that on the inside of us, who we appear to be on the outside, is, is true about who we are on the inside, that we have 100% integrity. There's an aspect of holiness that means that, that true, who we are on the outside is who we are on the inside. All of that is about us becoming a holy people. Really, a different kind of human, a unique community, a community like no other. To be a holy people is to be a people like no other. And in fact, um, this writer who's writing this letter to a church has a bunch of descriptions of what a holy people would look like. And I want to summarize it for you as we're going, what does it mean to be a holy people? Well, listen, it means that we are united in spite of great differences that we are clothed or covered with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, um, selfless love, peace, wisdom, encouragement, and to be joyful in all circumstances. That's what it means to be a holy people. And friends, here's why this is the most loving thing God could do for us and for you is to make you a holy person and to make us a holy person is because of we would become people like that. And here's the truth. You and I do not admire happy people. We admire holy people. Even though we wouldn't use that word to describe that. And if we said to them, oh, you're really holy, they would probably think we were insulting them, right? But this is what it means. We don't admire people who are so good at pursuing their own happiness, who are so good at just gaining more wealth, although sometimes we do admire that kind of stuff. But really the kind of people they are, we admire people who are holy. We admire people who are kind and gentle and humble. Someone once said, if you are in the presence of someone who's truly humble, you walk away feeling like a million bucks. Why? because they were interested in you. They asked you questions. They listened to you. They look you in the eye. They seem genuinely interested in who you are. They were affirmed because they weren't thinking about themselves. A truly humble person makes you feel better when you're around them. That's why we admire them. They're the kind of people we wanna be around. They're ultimately the kind of people we wanna be like. All of these descriptions of what it means to be compassionate and kind and humble and gentle and patient and forgiving and selflessly loving and had to have joy in all circumstances, no matter what's going on. Those are the people we admire. Those are the people we wanna be around. Those are the people we wanna be like. Those are the things we want said about us at our funeral. Think about it for a second. You want to be holy, teenage guy. Think about this for a second. You date a girl in high school and you kind of, and you end up breaking up. It doesn't go well. We're not going to get into all the details why. You know the details. <laughs> but, and then she starts to go around the school and tell other people what you were like. Now, what would you want her to say? Oh, you know what? This guy was really interested in his own happiness. That's what he was pursuing. Or would you want her to say he was really kind? He was actually really compassionate. He, he always wanted to know what I liked and was interested in who I was. He asked me really good questions. He was a good listener. He didn't use me and then throw me away. And when he made mistakes, when he said things he shouldn't have or did things he shouldn't, have, he apologized. Um, he's the kind of person that like, I feel better about myself having dated him, even though things didn't work out well. You're laughing, right? Because you can't imagine anyone saying that about you. Those aren't the kind of rumors people spread, but that is what you would want, right? You wouldn't want someone to say, oh yeah, he was really into his own happiness. Or what about if you're a principal or, or a shop steward or a, a shift manager or um, you know, some kind of a union leader or um, a, a leader in business? And you happen to be able to overhear in the lunchroom what all the people who work under you or work for you were saying about you. Would you want to hear, oh yeah, she was just really interested in her own happiness. I mean, she pursued her own happiness any chance she got. <laughs> Is that what you'd want to hear? No, you'd want to hear them saying, wow, she was so compassionate. She, she remembered when my mom passed away and sent me a note. She asked me how my weekend was and really wants to know. <laughs> she goes to bat for us. Man, she takes some bullets for our team, right? That's what you would want. It's the kind of person you want to be. It's the kind of boss you surely want to have. It's the kind of person you want to date. It's the kind of person you want to marry. It's the kind of leader or pastor or politician you want to have. It's someone who is actually holy, not someone who pursues their own happiness. Friends, deep down, this is what we all want, which is why the most loving thing God could do for you and for me and for us as a people is to make us holy. But here's the kicker. <laughs> You cannot be holy by yourself. You can't do it. God uses the faith community to make us more holy. 
God uses people and the relationships in the faith community to make us more holy. And in fact, at first, it's kind of painful, right? First and foremost, because when we get into close relationships, and I mean close relationships, I don't mean people you kind of know or whatever, you know this, any close relationship starts to reveal your flaws, right? Whether that's a marriage or as a parent or as a really close friend or someone in the body of Christ, you know that being in close relationship, what comes out of us starts to, it reveals our flaws. Because when you're in community, you realize you're kind of impatient or maybe you're judgmental or maybe you covet that person's house or their wealth or their job or their spouse or their looks or whatever. All of those things where in close relationships start to come out and realize, man, I gossip or I complain a lot or I, you know, that person said I, I hurt them. Like all of that stuff starts to come out when we are in close relationships. It, the relationships in a sense are like a mirror to us. They show us ourselves we see ourselves in the interpersonal relationships. And truthfully, we just want to blame the mirror and say, well, that's that person's fault. We go, and I need another mirror. I'm moving on. I'm going to move to another church, you know, because I feel hurt by this one or that didn't work out or I can't believe they talked to me like that or this is a place that's not welcoming and warm. In fact, a couple of days ago, as I was getting ready, the kids were getting ready for school. I was getting ready to come to work to write this message. Uh, the boys had a bit of a negative interaction with each other, two of them. So I went to intervene. And in the process, I lost my cool and said things that I regret and in a tone that I regret and really just ended up doing the things that they were doing. And at first, you want to just kind of blame them and go, well, they shouldn't have gotten this argument, whatever. But all I'm left with is my words and my tone ringing in my ears as they went off to school. And I was like, oh, that was ugly. Those relationships reveal stuff about me that is unholy, right? It's in community where we start to see how unholy we actually are. And so our instinct, our default instinct is to want to run, is to want to hide, is to want to practice, stand at a distance so those things never come out, never have anyone in my home, never go too close, never get into a group, never get into that play, never ask for prayer because I know that stuff is going to come out or to just move on because I was hurt or ignored. But we can't. We can't just move on. We can't ignore the mirror. We can't just change it for a new one. We can't just stand at a distance because we will miss out on the thing God wants to do in our lives, which is to make us more holy, more beautiful like him in all of those ways. And community does that for us as we get into relationships because not only do those relationships begin to reveal our selfishness, our judgmental attitudes, our gossiping ways, our complaining, our coveting, our unforgiveness, our grudges, our sensitivities, all of that comes out. But in a community of close relationships, we get to see what holiness looks like in another person. We get to see things in another person who's close to us. We say, I want to be more like that. We get to experience the benefits of generosity and go, man, I don't think about my money like that. How could they just give that away? Or man, I, I felt so welcomed when I was in their home. I wanna be able to do that. Wow, they are such a good listener. They literally looked in my eyes and asked me question after question. And they remembered the next time I saw them. Wow, that person is so willing to serve. Like they're, anytime there's a help, there's a need, there they are. Wow, that was a powerful, beautiful prayer. Um, we get to see holiness in the lives of other people and says, I want some of that. So we can't run, we can't duck it because not only does it begin to reveal the areas where we need to be made more holy, but we get to see what holiness looks like in other people and... This community is safe for us because it's the only place where we all agree to become holy together. We actually agree to become holy together. There's no other group in your life that has agreed to that. The baseball team you play on has not agreed all collectively to make you more holy together. No, you've agreed to try to win. And that doesn't necessarily make you more holy. It might make you angry. It might make you selfish. It might make you grumble about why you're at the bottom of the batting lineup or whatever it is. That's not what your baseball team has agreed to. Sometimes even our family or extended family, you know, we can't choose our family, you're born into it, but we don't necessarily all agree to say, yeah, you know what? We're gonna be committed to make each other holy. We're gonna be committed to be honest with each other. We're gonna be committed to trying to grow in our love for one another. Not necessarily. The workplace you have or the group of friends you have may not necessarily have agreed, but in the church, we agree. This is what God is trying to do in our lives. He's trying to make us more kind, compassionate, gracious, loving, forgiving, joyful, encouraging, wise. We get to do that for each other in this place. That's why the community of faith is indispensable to your own life, 
to becoming holy, to becoming the person you want to be. It's not a nice to have or nice for you and not for me or when I feel like I have time or I'm not busy this weekend. It is essential if we want to become holy people, the people we long to be around, the people we admire, the people we would love, other people to say, man, that's a beautiful person. We cannot do it without the community of faith. Now, before we kind of uh, get to the very practical outworking of this, I wanted to pause and do something that we do regularly, but call our minds to attention of what's happening. In this passage, it says, one of the things we do for each other as holy people is we sing to each other. Now, you may not have realized or thought about the fact that when we sing, we're singing to each other. We're not just singing to God, but there's a collective song. Now, some of us get mics because they can actually sing. And you know, the rest of us, we don't get a mic, but we get to sing. <laughs> we sing together. And this song, it's a new song. The band's actually gonna sing it uh, to us, but it's a song that invites us to come. Hey, as you are with all your brokenness, all your unholiness, come together. Bring who you are into the presence of God, into the community of faith. So as you listen to it, sometimes a new song is good because we're not familiar with it, so we're paying attention to the words. And as you catch on, you can start to sing, but let's use this as saying, yeah, this is what the community of faith is about. I wanna come into this place. I wanna bring who I am into this place and I'm invited to do it. So let's sing together. We began today with a question, you know, what is your happy place? (laughs) But I wanna end with an encouragement to you. If it's true that God is pursuing our holiness, not our happiness, and that he wants to make us into a holy people, a beautiful people, like we've just described, then you and I gotta find our holy place. <laughs> not our happy place, our holy place. And, and part, one of those places is in fact here as we gather together on a weekly basis to sing, like that song said, to come, to bring who you are. This is what we get to do together every week. And so I'd encourage you, we call it Celebrate Weekly. Don't miss it. There's lots of other things that might be in the way that where you're pursuing your happiness. But if you're gonna make this a holy place so you can become the person God's made you to be, carve out this time and this space for that. (coughs) Secondly, I uh, wanna just point out the fact that we have groups that are allowing us to get closer together. Because not all of this can happen on a Sunday morning. We don't necessarily have a lot of dynamic interpersonal interactions on a Sunday morning. You need other spaces and places that can be your holy place. One of those um, is Alpha. Um, That's something that if you're new to faith, if you're exploring faith, if you're a new uh, follower of Jesus, it's a group. It's It's an experience of coming together with other people who are in the same place as you, where you can begin to bring your questions and concerns. And um, we're running that live in all three of our places in King, in Bolton, and Vaughn. And so you can even scan the QR code there if you wanna find out and register. You can send a link. Um, You'll find it on our website, thewell.ca slash alpha. You can forward that to somebody who you think, yeah, they need community. They need a place where they can, they've been disappointed by their pursuit of happiness. Well, what does it mean to actually let God make us into holy people. This is a great space to do that. Um, And so I'd encourage you to invite people or to come yourself if that's where you're at. The other ones, some of you have experienced this before, some of you it's new, is our home groups. Um, That's the side dimension, right? In alpha, in home groups. It's It's the interpersonal relationships. It's not just up to God as we worship God, but as we grow in our relationships together. And in home groups, we we work through a liturgy called the upside down party. Each week is a bit different. One week is we're turning our attention to God in prayer and worship. Another week we're talking together and side. The third week we're, we're serving down. We, we're going to talk about that next week. And then we party <laughs> every four weeks. We have a party together. Um, and so if you've never been in a home group or you were before, or you were there in COVID and on and off, or you were online mostly, like this is a great chance to sign up to get together. And we have them all over uh, kind of the, the GTA um, by each of our sites in King and Bolton and Vaughn. And so I'd encourage you to go online and sign up for that. I think you can scan a QR code there as well. These are opportunities for you to carve out a holy place to allow God to use these side-by-side relationships to make you into the person that ultimately you long to be. And friends, if you are gonna become that person that you admire, if you're gonna become as some person that say you're looking to date, and he says, don't look for the right person. Become the person that the person you're looking for is looking for. (laughs) To become, he's basically saying, be holy, become the person that the person you're looking for is looking for. If you're going to become that person that leaves an impression on other people, they say, wow, I want more of that. If you want to become like the people who have so impacted you with their love, their humility, their wisdom, their kindness, their encouragement, 
then you and I got to work at finding that holy place. And so God bless you as you take a step this fall to step into one of these places together.